And it's 10 a.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening. Wherever the world you're watching from, it's Business Morning Live from Channels HQ. Uh, great to have you join us. I'm Ladi Williams. And uh, this morning, uh, we'll be kicking off uh, with the opening of the second uh, Niger Bridge uh, right here. We're going to be crossing over uh, there to see uh, how that's uh, going. And uh, we can see uh, visuals uh, right now. We see the second Niger Bridge. Uh, was uh, supposedly uh, still closed, even though the Minister of Works did uh, order that the bridge uh, be opened. And uh, from what we see uh, right now, we see that um, there is no vehicular movement uh, on the bridge uh, right now. But uh, we did get that uh, order uh, to be opened at 12 a.m. Uh, that's uh, today. And uh, from what we see uh, right now, we see there's still uh, men at work uh, right there on the bridge. Just uh, some uh, vehicular movement there we see, but uh, that should be one of the uh, workers on that bridge. But we don't see uh, commuters yet uh, on that bridge. But we'll be getting more information you know, as it uh, develops. We'll have our reporters uh, right there to bring us uh, up to speed on what's uh, happening uh, with the second Niger Bridge. But uh, good news for commuters. Uh, to, uh, that would definitely ease uh, traffic uh, around this Yuletide uh, season, but we'll keep tracking that uh, story now. Let's uh, move on now to the markets. Now we'll see oil prices uh, dipped in uh, early trade today. We'll see Brent futures there fell about 64 cents uh, to $82.06 uh, per barrel, while U.S. Uh, crude futures uh, slid about 73 cents to $76.55. Uh, we'll be drilling down. Uh, what's uh, moving that market uh, later on in commodities market update? Uh, but to grain commodities now, see Chicago soybeans futures slid for the first time in three sessions as prices come under pressure with growing fears of a global recession. Although expectation of strong U.S. demand stemmed losses, with wheat edged higher with lower output in Argentina supporting prices while corn uh, lost ground. The most active soybean contract on the Chicago Board of Trade uh, the SB1 fell 0.4% to $14.76 for a quarter of a bushel. And uh, wheat, uh, WV1 added quarter of a cent to $7.79 uh, for half a bushel, while corn, the CV1, lost about 0.2% to $6.49. And uh, back at the National Assembly, the Senate has asked the Central Bank of Nigeria uh, to cons uh, considerably adjust the cash withdrawal limits in response to public outcry over the policy. The upper chamber made this uh, recommendation at the conclusion of the debate by lawmakers on the policy. However, the upper chamber did not give a figure of what the withdrawal limit should be. Do take a listen. A sparse Senate chamber on Wednesday morning. Plenary session is supposed to be underway at this time. However, very few lawmakers in the chamber on a day slated for a crucial debate of the cash withdrawal policy by the Central Bank of Nigeria. The Deputy Senate President eventually arrives way behind schedule to preside over plenary. Moving along, the Chairman of the Committee on Banking presents the highly anticipated reports of his committee's engagement with the Central Bank of Nigeria on the cash withdrawal policy of the Apex Bank, which is expected to come into effect on January 9, 2023. He gives justifications for the reinstatement of a full cashless policy and nationwide implementation. The Central Bank latest action on Naira redesign and nationwide implementation of cashless policy are intended to further sustain this achievement in the quest to foster a safe, credible and efficient payment system that is the pride of all Nigerians and the envy of the world. It is neither targeted at any segment of the society nor intended to disenfranchise hardworking Nigerian citizens and businesses as insulated as employers. The debate begins. Some lawmakers are bothered about the withdrawal threshold, which they term unrealistic, while some others are concerned about the impact of the policy on Nigerians in the rural communities. Every day as I sit here in this chamber, I have every day not less than 100 people, laborers, working on my farm, and they have to be paid by 5 o'clock. Cash, of course, they don't possess POS, and they don't have bank accounts. The last UBA branch in my constituency, 
in my constituency was closed six years ago. Central bank should reconsider their decision. They should do 500,000 per day for individual, and they will do 3 million per day for corporate. There are 1.4 million POS operations in Nigeria and counting. They are making a living out of providing cash, out of filling in the gap that banks have failed to do in the last 15 years. Because CBN has failed to meet its financial inclusion target. Now, in one fell swoop, we're taking them out of business. But a few legislators maintain that the policy will benefit the country. Three point something, uh, uh, 3.2 or 3.3 trillion naira money in circulation. And it's only one point something trillion naira in the banking system. The danger is detrimental to the economy and the security of this country. The CPN Act did not forbid the POS that POS will not operate. But when we are now giving the impression that the policy is killing the POS, which means that uh, we are saying uh, uh, opposite of what the CBN Act is saying. At the conclusion of the debate, the Senate recommends that the CBN considerably adjust the withdrawal limits in response to public outcry on the policy. The upper chamber also commits to supporting the Apex Bank in terms of transformational payments and financial industry initiatives. Linda Kibi, Channels Television News. And definitely it is all about the Naira redesign right now. And today is the 15th and we're supposed to have the new notes in uh, circulation. We have our reporters out there and uh, did uh, tell me that uh, right now uh, some banks are, are dispensing the new notes uh, over the counter. Uh, but I did try an ATM uh, this morning around here, and I couldn't get the new notes. I did get old notes, uh, actually, but I guess it's just for over-the-counter uh, uh, users at this moment. But we'll see how, you know, the CBN and all the uh, banks actually dispense uh, through the ATMs. We'll keep tracking uh, all of that, and we'll bring you all the news uh, right here on Channels Television. Well, uh, to our first uh, conversation now, the Advertising Practitioners Council of Nigeria has mandated that skit creators, social media influencers, bloggers, and others seek its approval before advertising any product or service online. This order was contained in a statement released uh, by the Office of the Director General of APCON. Well, let's hear now from Dr. Olaliko uh, Fadolako, Director General, Advertising Practitioners Council of Nigeria, joining us via Zoom. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on short notice. Good morning, Mr. Oladi. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, uh, great to have you. I don't know if you have the new Naira notes yet, but uh, uh, I, 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 do, you have, do you have it yet? Yes, I think um, my people went to the bank yesterday and um, they gave them 200 naira pack. Okay. And where they put like, they insert like two pieces in each pack. Um, that was my first time of seeing the new notes. I think they, they insert um, two pieces of um, the new notes in each of the packs. So I have like six um, pieces now. Fantastic. Well, I, I'm, I'm still waiting for, for my piece. But, but let's uh, talk about uh, the, the main issue now, you know, uh, that order for uh, content creators and, and bloggers to get, you know, uh, approval, you know, from your uh, agency first. But why, why is this uh, coming now? Okay. Number one, this is not a new law. The first thing we need to understand is that advertising in Nigeria is a regulated industry. Advertising industry is a regulated industry. The second leg is that there are two types of media. We have the traditional media, we have the new media. The traditional media are the media that have been in existence before the new and online digital media. Now, the traditional media includes the broadcast, the print, and the out of home. Now, the new media. All platforms under the traditional media risk currently comply with betting, as in you cannot place an ad on radio, television, newspaper, um, billboard, out of home without compliance. Now, most of the adverts that we ordinarily not be approved for exposure have found their way to the online and digital media. You can imagine the number of Ponzi schemes that is being exposed on the digital media. Sometimes those influencers come up with some investment, promoting some investment, that after those people, after the people invest in that sector, 
they just discover that it's a scam. And we have so many shenanigans going on in that space. Let me say, I am a fan of these hitmakers and comedians. I watch them, I follow some of them, I, I, I laugh over, I, I appreciate the level of creativity they put in. We are not regulating their activity. We are not regulating what they are doing. We are only saying that when it comes to brand communication, advertising, please, you need to get approval in line with the law. So if you are doing whatever you are doing, we are not coming to the social media platform to regulate social media. What we are just saying is that before you advertise any product, there are needs to ensure that there is compliance with the law. There is a body they call Advertising Standard Panel. On that body, we have representatives of practically all the stakeholders in the industry. The self-regulatory organizations like AAPA, I mean, AAAN, MIPAN, MPAN, and all the, all the other bodies are there. Then on the other leg, we also have the other people there too. And in the government body, we have CBN, we have NAPDAC, we have... So when your product or advert is sent in, they look at it, check it there, they look at it, and they say, okay, this is good to go. But where we have a situation, somebody advertising on social media, this is a drug that can cure COVID, HIV, can cure diabetes and all those things, without making so scrupulous claim. That's what we are saying, that we need to start in time, sanitize that platform. We are not, we are not coming after the influencers, we are not coming after the comedians, we are not coming after the skit makers, we are not coming after the bloggers, we are not regulating their activity. We are only concerned about brand communication, advertising that they do. That's, that's the whole essence. All right. Well, uh, obviously, they, they do put, a, put in a lot of work uh, for uh, most of these uh, content uh, creators. And uh, obviously, uh, I'm wondering what the approval process, you know, is like. Is it, is it straightforward? Is it, you know, something that could actually uh, delay, you know, the, the profits they make, you know, from, you know, getting these adverts? No, the, the, the process is to file in your application. There are different categories of um, I'm vetting I'm process procedure. First of all, we have what we call the eight hours, we have the 16 hours, and we have the two weeks. So it depends on what you are applying for. So when you send this your material in, you need to go through a process or procedure that they need to just check the communication, the claims, and everything. So when you send in it, we, we understand the currency of time, and we understand the need for us to also up our game. That's why we have the eight hours. So if it is very urgent and needed to be, we can get it done within eight hours. So it is not a function of like I cannot delay the ask for it for. But the thing is that this thing needs to be properly done. So when this communication is out there, everybody knows that if you are talking about medical, I mean drugs and everything, it is confirmed and is you, you you are speaking to the to, to the right cure. If you are talking about investment, it's like okay. If this thing has been verified, and if anything goes on, there is a body you can you can you can petition so that you can you can find that. So it is not. We just try to ensure that there is sanity in that space. And and how do you see the content creators and bloggers? How do you see them responding? You know to this. Well, it, it's been it's been neither here nor there. Number one, you understand that whenever there's a policy in Nigeria, the first thing is to push back. Some people lay this on the federal government to say, no, they are looking for money. Some people start coming with other. But some other people will say, no, we agree. You can imagine, you can imagine. Recently, there was a, a, there was a celebrity that was advertising or requesting for advertising the land investment. And after people invested in it, it came out to be a scam. Sometimes, recently, this year, there was, there was an, I think, First quarter or second quarter, there was an advert from one of the banks that was up there, and it, it led to practically every part of the country complaining. And all. these things, if they have gone through vetting procedure, they will not have been approved. We we are reaching out to the bloggers, we are engaging the street makers. We 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 need to continue to engage them as stakeholders in that space. We started by talking to the primary digital media space owners, which are the big tech. Um, we are we are we are concluding with them now to agree a vetting protocol for online media. So we are taking it further by talking to the secondary digital media space. So now you know these hit makers, content producers, and all content, and 
they are all within that space of secondly digital media space owners. So we are, we are still engaging them, we are reaching out to them, we are trying to tell, okay, if there's need for variation, how do we agree? If there's need for you to speak to us, we have sent out letters, we are reaching out to them to see that if we can have a conversation with them to also know if there are challenges that we need to address. It is supposed to be a win-win situation for everybody, for the stakeholders and for the general public. Uh, and what role, you know, with the brands, you know, that, you know, require these services, what role are they going to play in all of this? The brands already know that advertising, either on the new media or traditional media, are supposed to be, I mean, to be approved. So in some cases, or in most cases, the big brands are already complying. But we have situations whereby there are some people who want off transactions, scammers, and all those people, you can imagine somebody telling you that this is drug for HIV if you cure COVID and all those things. So there are some people that are faceless and they do their business on online. You can imagine, I, I know of somebody who, who advertised um, shoes online and the next thing is people paid him money and the guy disappeared and look, the people started looking for him and things like that. So we cannot really, we don't even have record of what happened in that space. So we need to we need to bring the whole space under regulation for everybody. At least you can ask me now what is happening in the digital media space, and I'll give you a figure. So if this is done, it's just to help us better manage and take advantage of that digital media space. So everybody will be happy. And and what's gonna be you know done to ensure you know compliance? Well, um, we have acquired some technology recently. And we have trained our um, monitoring officer. They are out there, you know, unlike the primary digital media space, which you need to agree protocol with the big tech. For the secondary digital media space, it's a direct monitoring. For example, you just go to the blog and you check day by day and all their media presence and all the platforms that they are present. So this is a lot easier than the primary digital media monitoring. Exercise. So what we're doing now is that we have built capacity and we have sent our, our people out now to ensure compliance. And uh, also, you know, uh, what's the practice like? Is this, you know, what's obtainable, you know, in other de developed uh, climbs? Are they also regulated? Yes, there's no, there's no climb, there's no market that closes a uh, uh, business open. As much as... Um, Video call. You can't do video call in some part of the Arab Emirates. You can't. If you go to Saudi Arabia, for example, there's, there's a limit to which uh, you can expose some model. There's a limit to which you can use their women on social media, notwithstanding that the traditional media is completely out of it. So you won't say because it's a digital media space that you can do anything. You, we all saw what happened in Qatar. It's in even 24 hours to the event, to the takeoff of the event. They still come back to say, this is our rule, this is our law, this is how it should be treated. There are some things we don't do in Nigeria. For example, we don't do disparage advertising in Nigeria. You can't say your product is better than my product. It must be issue-based. There are some things we also don't tolerate in Nigeria. You cannot just come and market my own product and some other things like that. But these things happen on the social media. So in other prime and market, they even have already agreed protocol to what can be exposed to their community. And everybody or comply with it. All right, uh, I want to thank you so much. This is obviously a developing story and we'll continue having uh, conversations about this and tracking uh, uh, compliance. I want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Olaliko Fadolakpo, I am DG, Advertising Practitioners Council uh, of Nigeria. It's great having you on the program today. My pleasure, thank you very much. Please let me just take this message to everyone. We are doing this in the best interest of the general public. We love the comedians, we love the street makers, we love each and every one of them. We wish them the very best. We appreciate what they are doing, putting Nigeria on the global map. But what we are not saying is we're not regulating their activities. We're not talking about what they are doing. But we're just saying that by moving into that brand communication aspect, the, the, the things they are saying needs to align with our code of advertising, the Nigerian code of advertising. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much uh, for that. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, well, for our commodities uh, market update now, we have uh, Dr. Adesola 
uh, Sumoni uh, joining us uh, uh, via Zoom to give us an update of what's happening uh, in that uh, market. Great to have you, Desola. Thank you for having me on the show. <clears throat> All right, so uh, uh, this, uh, so uh, well, we've seen uh, the oil market, there's still a lot of uh, volatility in that market, but we're seeing Brent at uh, $81. Uh, dollars. What's, what's driving sentiment now? Thank you for that question, Ladi. Um, two, two, two main factors. On the demand side, uh, we have um, <clears throat> bullish out outlook for oil demand next year. OPEC has come to you know, revise upward the outlook for oil demand. They forecast that oil demand would increase by around 2.25 million barrels by the next year. Also, the International Energy Agency has also forecast upward uh, oil demand outlook for 2023. They also forecast that oil demand will be up by around 1.2 million barrels by the next year to one, 101 million barrels. So that is positive, and that would be on the back of, of, um, of a slowing in the pace of interest rate hikes in the, U in the U.S., the U.K., and the European Central Bank. But on the supply side, we also have, um, so that is what's driving the fact, that's what's driving oil prices on the demand side. On the supply side, we still have um, uh, around 622,000 uh, barrels of oil taken offline from the Keystone uh, pipeline, which is a huge pipeline that supplies uh, the United States oil from, from Canada. So like I mentioned earlier, they discovered a spill um, in that pipeline, which is the largest spill that that we've seen in the United States for decades. And around by the time they discovered the spill, around I think 14,000 barrels had been spilled already. So it's going to take some time for them to clean up the spill as well as repair the leak. So those are the factors um, driving oil prices um, at this time. All right, uh, Desola, we'll continue the conversation, but obviously we have that breaking news uh, today. Let's uh, quickly head now uh, to the second uh, Niger Bridge. I, I believe it's, uh, it's open. It's right. It's open uh, right now. We did get uh, a confirmation uh, from our reporters on ground there that the bridge is open, and uh, we we see some uh, movement right now on the bridge. That's uh, our people there right now on the bridge, and uh, I can't uh, seem to I can't see other cars uh, right now. But obviously, we know that this is going to really help uh, with the uh, traffic congestion, and we see. And we see the side of bridge open uh, from now to the 15th of January. And obviously the second part will uh, also be uh, opened uh, sometime in uh, February. And obviously this will ease uh, travel for people going uh, to the east, and uh, obviously this is uh, definitely what might they'll see other uh, cars there on the bridge uh, right now. The second Niger Bridge open for uh, commuters at this time. Good news right here, and uh, obviously this all I'm sure this is going to be. Uh, this will definitely have some impact, you know, on the commodities market, and you know we should see some free flow. Indeed, indeed, Ladi, this is this is really really good news. Um, that the Niger Bridge, Second Niger Bridge, is open. Um, no country can develop sustainably without um adequate um infrastructure. I think this will ease human traffic. It will ease it will ease um it will boost um economic activity as well as trade between between you know the the east and the southern part part of the country because you know it's going to ease ease traffic. And this brings to mind a report I read yesterday about uh, um. By the by, the World Bank, where they said at the current pace of of infrastructure expenditure, it will take around three hundred years <laughs> for Nigeria to fill its uh, infrastructure gap. So while this is good, while this is positive, I think more needs to be done, and indeed more can be done uh, to boost the to, to to kind of fill up the infrastructure gap uh, in, in in the country. Oh, definitely, and uh, obviously the next. Uh... Uh, government, whoever wins, you know, have uh, have their job cut out for them, you know, uh, going forward Indeed. for uh, uh, filling that infrastructure uh, gap. But let, let's uh, look at the, the gas market now. We see LNG prices there uh, still uh, quite uh, 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 down, you know, at this time, even though that trend did start, you know, uh, after the, we, we saw uh, LNG hit new highs, you know, this year. But that trend is still going on down. Uh, thank you for that question, Lady. I think just like the oil market, the LNG market is also quite volatile this period. 
many factors, but one one of the key drivers is because of again Russia's uh, 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 Russia's uh, war in Ukraine, which is which is affecting um, um, LNG supply as well. But as of now, one key what's one of the key news in the market is uh, Australian uh, price cap, where Australia is trying to um, regulate the price of, of of natural gas in the domestic economy. Essentially, they're trying to have um, a price ceiling. So that you know, uh, uh, gas is cheaper for for the for the for Australians. But what what's good? The problem is that a price ceiling usually creates a, a shortage in, in the domestic economy. And the fact that more people want to buy natural gas than the suppliers are willing to supply, so there's going to be a shortage. And this such <laughs> this uh, shortage deal with with imports, and that is why the, the prospect that there will be new demand coming from Australia, I think that is part of what is driving prices. Um, upwards at this time. All right, let's uh, look at cocoa now. We see that's also down about 0.67%. Uh, uh, that, 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 there's also volatility in that market. Indeed. Like, you know, Ladi, like uh, the Nigeria, Ghana, Ivory Coast, uh, I think Cameroon account for around 45% of total cocoa production globally. And at the moment, uh, we are seeing, obviously, at this time of the year, we see we have um, the Amatan, which is dry winds coming from the from the from the Sahara, uh, which usually has a negative impact on cocoa production in the sense that it dries out the cocoa pods and affects the quality of the cocoa. What is happening at this time of the year is that we have a mild, we have a mild, uh, mild uh, 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 hamatan season at least at this time of the year, and the, the the farmers in in Ivory Coast are not worried that it's going to affect the harvest. As a matter of fact, they expect uh, a large harvest coming out of Ivory Coast. Uh, uh, from now up on, uh, the main the main crop of, of of cocoa for this season, they expect a huge harvest. On the other side, in Nigeria, we are seeing um, excessive rain. I seen excessive rain and the floods that happened earlier, um, I think around late November. Those are, are, are making the soil, I think, too moist and leading to this black pot disease. So we are seeing a, some of reduction in output or in production from Nigeria for big supply from. From Ivory Coast, so those those are the two factors that are affecting our cocoa prices at the moment. While you know the output from from Ivory Coast on one hand is reducing um oil uh, is reducing cocoa prices, the reduction from supply of supply from Nigeria is kind of uh, tapering the reduction in prices. And talking about uh, uh, Ghana, we did get that uh, inflation data uh, yesterday, fifty over fifty percent. That, that was quite, that was a big one. That, that was massive. And I'm wondering, you know, what can be done to bring down this level of inflation? I mean, at the moment, Ghana, they are trying to uh, implement our conventional, conventional monetary policy tools. They are using conventional monetary policy tools uh, to uh, uh, try to bring inflation down. If you look at their interest rate, they are also hiking interest rates uh, quite, quite uh, sharply. Um, as a result of, of, of this um, hike in inflation. And also the currency is weakening just like we have in Nigeria. The, the uh, Ghanaian city is also weakening uh, um, as you know, we see um, a hike in, 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 in interest rates uh, globally. So I think at the moment we see at least the key conventional monetary policy tools, we are seeing contractionary, sharply contractionary uh, 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 monetary policy. And this is quite interesting because a colleague of mine, a friend of mine is actually uh, a top person in the Central Bank of Ghana and is having a really, really hard time with inflation. Quite, quite a tough time. And obviously, we'll, we'll be see what the uh, Central Bank will do with rates uh, come next year. But although we have uh, other rate meetings coming today, uh, the BOE, uh, the Eurozone, what are you expecting for those? I mean, for those, globally, actually, we are seeing something happen. Right now, we are seeing, first of all, we are seeing the first sign of inflation decelerating globally. In the UK, for instance, inflation for November came in at 10.7%, which was lower than the 41-year high of 11.1% in October. So this is a sign that maybe, just maybe, um, inflation is beginning to, to decelerate. In the United States, we also found a similar trend where inflation decelerated. Uh, the pace of increases um, decelerated for the first time in about 18 months. And as a result, we saw the the, the the U.S. Fed uh, increased rates by, I think, 0.5 percent um, yesterday. The Bank of England is also expected to follow suit by increasing rates by 0.5 percent, as well as the um, European Central Bank. Taking into context that prior to now, they have been increasing rates consistently uh, by 0.75 percent. So it seems that 
even the, uh, the, the, the central banks, global central banks are increasing the increasing interest rate at a, a smaller magnitude, even though they expect to do that for longer, but they are reducing the, the hikes in interest rate. So the forecast, as of the moment, we expect to see a smaller increases going into 2023, and we, be, we will begin to see uh, um, accommodative uh, monetary policy uh, cycle starting 2024. Uh, uh, this will, uh, obviously, uh, the uh, festivities, we're, we're already, I don't know if you're getting that, you know, Christmas uh, uh, bite yet, but obviously, what, what's happening with the commod uh, domestic commodities market? At this time, uh, first of all, we are having, I mean, I, you should come to London in Christmas. It's, 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 it's brilliant, right? So we are having this uh, domestic, uh, we're having this Christmas. The run up to Christmas is really exciting uh, uh, in, in London. Uh, in addition to that, we're having a cold spell. Large, as I speak to you, is negative seven degrees. This is the coldest that it's that been in the UK. But anyway, out of that, for the domestic commodities market, we are seeing a mixed bag, really. For, for most commodities, we are seeing a decline in, in, in their prices. If you look at the price of um of, of, of yellow guy, for instance, the 50 kg bank, no, of yellow guy, we've seen it go down by, I think, 43% month on month to 13,000 naira. If you look at the bag of rice, uh, I'm particularly uh, concerned about rice because I buy rice for my folks back in Nigeria. We've seen the, bag, the price of the bag of rice go down at 4% to 43,000 naira. Beans also, we are seeing it go down around. 7.6% uh, to 36,000. That is the 30 kg, uh, a 50 kg bag of beans. And new yam, we are seeing it go down around 6% to 1,500. I think this is mainly due to uh, um, harvest season. Usually during the harvest season, we see uh, uh, an increase in supply in domestic markets, which kind of tapers prices a little bit. But on the other hand, we are still seeing some prices trend upwards. If you look at the price of flour, it's up 6.2% to 34,000. They are driven mainly by by weaker exchange rate and also higher prices of wheat in the global economy. We've seen now the price of wheat has been quite volatile, but mainly uh, are trending upwards in the global economy. I've seen the price of pepper also up around 85%. This is quite significant, uh, to 37,000 naira month on month. And price of onions also up around 41% uh, 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 to, to, uh, to 65,000. So I think it's a mixed bag. Right, uh, a lot for consumers to, to uh, deal with, obviously, in, in 2022. Rising prices, now uh, festive season, obviously prices are going to even, you know, climb even more with, with demand, even though incomes have been squeezed. Quite an incredible year. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Desola uh, Simone, for giving us your perspective today. Thank you for having me, Lad. All right, now let's uh, move on to the markets. And uh, today we actually have uh, Ini. Ini is going to be giving us uh, details. Not Anita. Anita is out there trying to get us <laughs> yeah, details get us of what's Naira. happening with the yes, new Naira. You yes. know? And uh, uh, he called in earlier to say, uh, even though we do not have uh, the spencing of the new notes in uh, the, P, the, the ATM, right. but over the counter in some banks, they have started giving out the new, but it's just the 1,000 Naira and not the 200 or the 500, it's the 1,000 Naira that he's seen now. So that's uh, right. updates. And when I the, tried, you know, the ATM uh, uh, this, this morning, morning, I was quite, you know, not just you, not disappointed just you. because yes, I was expecting it, new notes. Exactly. <laughs> Even over in uh, the Federal Capital Territory, where the CBN is headquartered, uh, as of this morning, uh, we hadn't seen the new notes yet. Right. So I, 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 guess I guess we'll the, give them time. The banks are we'll working on it. Let's and obviously, at least 24 hours. You know, it's just expectations are high because yes. the CBN had told us, I think about two weeks ago, that right. the new notes have been uh, shared into the banks. Right. So the banks were in possession of it more than a week before now. So right. you'd have expected that bright and early this morning, just as we had the second Niger Bridge, we would see exactly. the notes. <laughs> <laughs> and talking about the Niger uh, Bridge, you know, we also got some instructions there from yes. the federal government. No overspeeding, you know, on that bridge. No heavy-duty trucks. No heavy-duty. <laughs> and, and then we also have to remember it's not totally done yet. Right. This is just going to be open for, I think, about a month. Uh, from today to the 15th of January, uh, just for those traveling. And it's only one way open at a time. Right. So because at this time, uh, 
people are expected to go from the south to the east. Uh, Eastern Brothers like to spend Christmas exactly. with family and friends. So that portion of the bridge will be open. While uh, towards the end, the last 15 days, I believe, uh, the other part will be open for transportation or traffic to come from the east back to the west. Right. So, and uh, the, the minister, Mr. Fashola, had told us that the um, roads linking to the bridge and connecting to the express are not ready yet. So those, so the bridge will still have to be closed afterwards. Right. So much work still. A lot of work uh, to, to be, be done. done. But uh, I like the way you linked it with uh, Adesola, talking about commodities. Because exactly. if we had better transit, better transportation, more infrastructure, then you would expect the issue of logistics which has been a major challenge in right. transporting food and agriculture, even petroleum products. Exactly. You know? We would have seen some prices come down. Exactly. By, by now. Exactly. Because the cost of transporting it would reduce and there will be more roads, you know, easier access, and that will also help uh, exactly. supply. Well, let's hope for more you know, like this going forward. Well, I hope for more in the markets, uh, Ladi. <laughs> I have to tell you, I was disappointed because at intraday yesterday during Business Incorporated, we saw the All Share Index, the NGX in Nigeria was at 49. Yeah. But at the close of trade, it had gone Just down to 48. Lost that level. Yes, we lost that, even though the market still ended in the green. But, I mean, we lost that 49,000 again at 48,988.04. Equities uh, is still at 26, been dragging this 26 for a bit. Uh, if we see the volume, yeah, there you go. The volume, the value, and the deals all in the red. Can you imagine our deals just at 2,800? This is normally about 5,000, uh, 4,000, 3,000 at least. Now we have less than that. Uh, yesterday it was down almost 14%. And uh, looking at the sectors, now Bois Cement has been a shining star now, I think for two days. Um, my favorite banking <laughs> in the red, 0.07% down. Consumer goods also. Industrial goods, that's where Bois Cement uh, pushed it. 1.46% in the green. Insurance down almost 1%. Oil and gas also down and uh, if we look at uh, the other markets now that's the fixed income market the federal government bond i believe uh, yesterday there was a treasury bills auction uh, at the fixed income market at a money market and uh, i think we would have chikanwa chikuna head bonds trading at uba to join us and give us the result of that trading hi chika good morning hey. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How awesome. You? I'm great. And you? So how was the trade yesterday? High expectation. Uh, the fixed income space seems to be taking the customers from the equities market. Yeah, um, it, yeah you're, you're absolutely right. Um, that is because the youth have been very attractive over the past few months. Uh, we saw you move from um, uh, 9% to about the uh, 15.2% on the bond side and then 14% um, on the TBU side. However, um, there was a, a TBU auction yesterday, like you mentioned, um, well over 13.54 billion was on offer and that was the same amount that was sold. Um, but the big news was the drop, significant drop in the rate, especially uh, on the longer end, um, dropped about uh, 116 basis points uh, from, from 13.05 to uh, 9. Uh, 0.89, and that's really huge. Uh, so this morning, market has opened um, trading on, along that line, and uh, you know, we probably will see this with uh, the next option if it doesn't change. Okay, so uh, can we safely say that the fixed income space can be a hedge for investors at this time? Can we say that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, um, especially with the attractive yield. Um, so it's more of like investors that are looking for um, and then also investors looking to get some because um, don't forget the inflation is picking up most of the uh, uh, most of the income as well. So you need to get something that will at least uh, give you value for for your investment. All right, Chuka. And then there's a bonds uh, auction expected on Monday. What do we see from there? Yeah, actually, the, uh, there was a bond auction last week, Monday, this week, Monday. Uh, that was actually the last uh, portion for the year. Um, we, we had the uh, 225 billion was of offer, and then 264.5 uh, 
2.5 to 1. So um, we also saw a significant drop in the yield, especially on the longer end. We saw a drop of uh, about 40 basis points from uh, 15.2 to 15.8. And that, uh, um, that was the, that's for the 2037 uh, bond. And so um, this bond actually is currently trading around uh, 14.8 uh, in level. That's to show you the fashion on the bond and then what's been happening on the country. And so um, going into the rest of the year, we will probably see this uh, this yield over around this uh, this area. And the essence, the, the reason for for the drop in yield, especially on the 37, is that a lot of traders went short on it, and so those who lost at the auction uh, are still panicking to cover. That's why we can uh, this drop on the yield on the and the 37. All right, Chuka, watch you cool ahead uh, bonds trading at UBA. Thank you so much for that perspective, and we'll certainly be looking out for that bonds trading on Monday and uh, see if, as you said, uh, the fixed income market will remain a hedge for investors at this time. All right, just before I hand over to Ladi, uh, the federal government bonds yesterday, looking at the trade, how it ended yesterday, had six to five deals yesterday. That's a lot. And uh, uh, we see that, well, the one that caught investors' attention most was the one that's maturing on the 18th of April, 2037. That had 34 deals worth more than 27 billion naira. Money going through the fixed income market at this time. I wonder what the inflation number that we're expecting this week will do to uh, this movement. Uh, the Treasury bills, where you had that auction yesterday, number of deals that has not been captured yet. Uh, three deals yesterday worth about 11 billion naira, and you had the November 2023 and the March 2023. Looking at the unlisted market now, uh, Anita will call this the smaller market. Well, we see that the uh, index was unchanged at 709.56, and market cap uh, still struggling to regain that 1 trillion naira level, but it hasn't gotten that volume yesterday, just about 137,000 worth 5.48 and just seven deals for that unlisted OTC market of yesterday. Well, at least the fixed income uh, is giving a little bit of hope, laddie, right. to investors. NGX is not doing so bad. Not, uh, not so bad. Not Even so bad. Even though it was the best performing yes. you know, uh, equity market in the world yeah. <laughs> earlier this year. Yeah. And, and, you know, talking about the market, I don't know how crypto is doing now. I'm sure you give that to us in a couple of minutes. Obviously, it's but, so, so volatile right now. Yeah, it's volatile, yeah. but I think the equities market, after the uh, lower than expected inflation numbers, you know, we saw the market kind of relaxing a little bit, exactly. expecting CBNs not to be so aggressive yeah. in their interest rate hike. And no, I think and that's given get, You know, we, we did get a pullback, you know, with their, with their last hike. At mm. least it wasn't as big as the yes, previous it one. Yes, wasn't, it wasn't as big as expected. I think the uh, European Central Bank is meeting today. We're expecting BOE, a decision. BOE, yeah. And then the Bank of England, right. and, I'm sure. And they're also expecting a less, you know, uh, less aggressive than expected. Especially you know, with that uh, recovering growth for the UK. Uh, right. I, I think that kind of made people, oh, let's relax a bit. Exactly. Uh, and then so, we, so much for the yeah. central bankers to deal with. But Juliana you know, will tell time. you that she uh, will tell <laughs> the cost of living crisis uh, oh, yes. hasn't got anywhere it, yet. It's still there. We still have all the same issues. But mm. it would be interesting to see you know, how all of this you know, plays out into 2023. Investors are watching. Especially in Nigeria. Like, oh, yes. Because the election is a very big deal for Nigeria. It is a big it's deal. a big deal when it comes to decision making for investors. It's a big deal for where people they put their money, where people stay during right. the election. You know, the uncertainty or certainty of the transition. You know, it's, it's, it's a interesting big deal. to see how the, the markets actually react. You know, <laughs> well, once we have a new president <laughs> and a new government in power, I believe so. It's interesting to see. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you uh, for yeah. having me. Yeah. Let's uh, head on to other markets now. Talking about the crypto space, that we see the sentiment in the market it's, it's, it's fear at 31 points, uh, back at the 30 uh, level. I've not seen this level for uh, a bit now. It's um, better than extreme fear, showing that traders are more. Are interested in putting some money in this market at this time. Let's look at the uh, market cap, 861.49 billion dollars. That's down 1.11 percent. We saw the market, you know, react to uh, the Fed there, kind of hawkish tone, you know, going forward. And we saw, you know, Bitcoin lost that 18k level 
Volume trade in the total crypto space down 11.62%. And we see Bitcoin dominance at 39.61%. Uh, Let's look at the price of Bitcoin uh, this morning. Okay, well, that's uh, not showing the price there. Let's look at Ethereum. We see Bitcoin that was trading at $17,330. Uh, Ethereum, $1,290. Uh, did lose that one three level, down 2.36% on the news of a uh, hawkish tone there from the uh, U.S. Fed yes, yesterday. Volume traded, it's $8.31 uh, billion. We've seen lower volume, you know, this uh, uh, morning's now. So let's look at the top alt by market cap. See, it's all red, all of them reacting. As long as Bitcoin sneezes in this market, the altcoins do always react. Let's bring in Solomon Amunde now, uh, digital market analyst. Hello, Solomon. Yeah, good morning, Lardy. Morning, Solomon. So we, we saw the, you know, the crypto market did react positively you know, to that uh, CPI print. But come Fed Day, we're seeing the market, a Bitcoin price, losing that, you know, 18,000 uh, level. W was the tone really that hawkish? Yeah, so um, basically, it's always expected as a general rule of thumb that whenever the Fed increases their interest rates, we see the stock prices crashing. And most times when they reduce it, we see the opposite happening in the stock market. So it's, it's kind of mutual sometimes that the same thing happens in the crypto market. Although in the crypto market, we have some other extra determinants to that determine where the price would go, if it will be bullish or bearish. But as we saw yesterday, the impact made it short term bearish, but invariably we weren't really expecting Bitcoin to break above 20K this December. And we're still expecting it to range and accumulate heavily within 17k and around 19k dollars. All right, but but Solomon, you know, it's been obviously an interesting year for you know risk assets. We've seen them, you know, go on that downward trend, you know, ever since uh, uh, February. But now we're going into 2023. Is there any light at the end of the tunnel for risk assets like Bitcoin and and equities? There's definitely light at the end of the tunnel. Why? It's because we've hit the rock bottom. Um, where we are at right now, we didn't expect to be there when we started this year. But this is like the worst case scenario. We've seen Bitcoin bottom at around 15K dollars and we've seen the stock market crash heavily. Um, 2022 has been like the worst financial year within the last about 12, 14 years or thereabout. So I would say 2023 would definitely be better than 2022. I mean, it can't get worse than it is already. If it gets worse than this, then it will be crazy for the entire market. But we're expecting positivity in 2023. Now, we know obviously there's fear in most of these markets, and there's also some kind of expectation that there's still some downward, you know, pressure, you know, uh, price movement coming for, uh, for Bitcoin. You know, some still believe $12,000 is still, you know, possible. What do you think? Yeah, twelve thousand dollars seems like it's possible, but but then again, if we look at what made Bitcoin even crash to about fifteen k dollars, it it was because of um, external forces and also the cases of um, FTX, the case of FTX that happened in the month of November. That was basically what made Bitcoin crash down to fifteen k, and we saw a quick recovery within two to three weeks. And at the same time, another event that made Bitcoin crash below that three k, which was around May June this year. It was because of the Terra Luna crash. So assuming we didn't have any of those two events that happened, which are like Black Swan events, we didn't have any of the Black Swan events, Bitcoin would have been able to maintain about above 29K dollars. So expecting 12K dollars, I think that would be too much of a stretch for most traders expecting 12K dollars, unless we have another extremely bad Black Swan event, for example, a, a, a hit on a major exchange that might force people to FOMO and sell off their assets, that's the only thing that might crash us down to 12K. And right. even at that to be quite temporary. All right, we'll keep watching on. And obviously, we expect 2023 to be a very interesting year uh, for the markets. Be watching out for that. Thank you so much, uh, Solomon Monday, Digital Market Analyst. Thank you. All right, so that's how the market is looking uh, today. We see it's uh, mostly okay, red. Right, and if we look at the, uh, uh, the top uh, gainers uh, today, we see uh, mostly uh, single-digit gains were seen uh, this morning. Obviously, the markets are reacting to what's uh, happening. And obviously, we'll be getting the BOE and uh, Eurozone 
uh, 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 rates uh, uh, setting meeting today. We'll see how hard they're going to go, if they're going to go higher or lower, and we'll see how the markets actually react. They'll be tracking all of that right here. All right, that's the show today. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to join us at 1.30 for Business Incorporated uh, for more updates and developments uh, in the world of business. And definitely, if you get the new note, you can tweet us us and uh, let us know uh, how you feel about it and what it looks like. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.